God's Word I want to consider with you this morning is the Gospel lesson we heard. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In Christ Jesus, dearly beloved, what kind of child is he going to be? An expecting parent may very well ask. What kind of baby is he going to be? Born healthy and on time? Good weight? Will he take to a sleeping schedule easily or not so easily? How soon will he walk? How soon will he talk? What kind of child is he going to be? Is he going to be a mama's boy constantly clinging to her leg, wanting nothing more than her attention? Or is he going to follow his dad around, wanting to be just like him when he grows up? What kind of child is he going to be? Is he going to take to discipline well, be obedient? Or is he going to be a little bit of a pistol? Persistently pushing those limits. What kind of man is he going to grow up to be? Is he going to be a gifted athlete, a, a peerless intellectual? What will he do? What will he be? There are a million questions that could race through the mind of an expecting parent. I think it's safe to say that Mary's experience was quite different. Because a lot of those questions were kind of preempted by what she was told by the angel Gabriel. When Gabriel came to give her the news that she would be the mother of a son, a savior. There really wasn't anything particularly noteworthy about Mary or her betrothed, Joseph. They were commoners from a bit of a <clears throat> backwater town in an ill-respected region. He was a construction worker. The only thing of note for, for either of them was that they were descendants of, of David. But you know what, I, I suppose that's really fitting because after all, David was literally the last person in his family that the prophet Samuel expected to be God's chosen king over Israel. Yet David was chosen by God's grace because God does not consider the external appearance. And so, in the same way, not considering the external circumstances, God chooses meek and lowly Mary for an awesome task and responsibility. And what better way to deliver some extraordinary news to her than through an extraordinary messenger, an angel named Gabriel. Greetings, you who are highly favored, he said to her. The Lord is with you. Now, it's not every day that you get a visit from an angel who stands before the presence of God. And maybe that is why Mary was initially troubled at his greeting. The way this is written in the original is, is for at least in, in, for a moment, questions were racing through Mary's mind as she's wrestling with this stuff. Well, what does this mean? How could, how could I be highly favored? I'm highly favored? Why me? And she's troubled. The picture there being of, of waters being stirred up. That's how she was inside quickly wrestling with all this stuff, but the angel is quick to bring some calm with God's grace, literally. You have found favor or grace with God. You will be with child and will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name 
Jesus. She would have a son. So far, it sounds pretty normal. Yeah, you're going to be an expecting mother, Mary. You're going to have a little baby boy. And you know what? You're going to name him Jesus, which was derived from a very common Hebrew name at the time, Yeshua. Or as we might pronounce it, Joshua, meaning he saves, or shorthand for the Lord saves. And so it just seems that Mary has, uh, at this point from the angel Gabriel, a pregnancy announcement, a gender reveal, and a name reveal, all rolled into one. But it doesn't stop there. Yes, she would be the mother of a baby boy, a fully human child of her own. But that's not all. He would be the Son of the Most High. He would sit on the throne of his father, David, and his kingdom would endure forever. Just as we heard God promise to David in our Old Testament lesson. Wow. Extraordinary promises to say the least. And so if you were in Mary's shoes, maybe you would ask the question, well, how? How is this all going to be? And Mary asked the same exact thing, how? Because kind of step one is, she says, I'm a virgin. How can I be with child? Answer? This wouldn't be just her son. This would also be the Son of God. Yes, she would carry and nurture in her womb the Son of Man and Son of God. Truly and fully man. Truly and fully God. Not a hybrid. Not a mixture of the two. Not half of each. Fully both. At the same time, and brothers and sisters, what a mind-boggling mystery that is to ponder. How can he be 100% God and 100% human at the same time? How can God become man? How can God become man without diminishing his divinity? It makes our brains run in circles. And so whenever we come across anything in God's Word that makes our brains run in circles, it's good to go back to what Gabriel told Mary. For nothing is impossible with God. God can do it. Quite simply, because He's God. And He can. Yes, like Mary, we may want to ponder the question, how, how can this be? But brothers and sisters, how is not the most important question for us to ponder? Instead, it's why. Why did this son of Mary and son of God have to be a son of Mary and a son of God? Why did he have to be fully human and fully God? Answer? To be what his name declares. A Savior. Hebrews chapter 2 tells us, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Yes, he is fully human because all humans have sinned and fall short of God's glory. He is fully human because all sinful humans Face death. He is fully human 
to live in the place of fully human sinners. He is fully human to die in the place of fully human, sa- of fully human sinners. He is a son of man, a son of Mary, fully human, to be a Savior. God's Word also tells us in Psalm 49, no one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. Try as I might, I can't pay for any of your sins, and try as you might, you can't pay for any of mine. The only sin I can pay for is my own, and that would be with my own death. I can't die for your sins, you can't die for mine. And so to do what his name declares, Jesus has to be more than truly and fully human. He has to be truly and fully God, so that the death He would die, he would die once for all. Yes, he is fully God because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. He is fully God to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not just for ours but for the sins of the whole world. All of your sin, he is fully God to be a Savior. A son of Mary, fully human. The son of God, fully God. To be a savior. For you. And so this news that Gabriel delivers to Mary isn't just good news for Mary. It's good news for every sinner. And that's all of us. Finally, dear Christians, consider Mary's response to all this. Consider the fact that she was not yet married. She was betrothed, engaged, as we might call it, pledged to be married, but not married yet. And she was about to be pregnant. Consider what that would mean for her. And consider how there would be no rational, at least in the human mind, rational explanation for why that would be the case, that she would be pregnant before being married. Consider what that might cost her. Her future husband, her reputation, perhaps even more should she be accused of adultery. Yet when Gabriel comes to her and says, you are going to, as a virgin, conceive and give birth to the Son of God, what is her response? The Greek is so vivid. She says, behold, the servant of the Lord, referring to herself. She didn't say, um... I'm not so sure about this, that's great and all, but, or can I have a couple days to think about this and I'll get back to you? No, with a simple yet profound trust and a fully hearted submission to God and His good and gracious will, she wishes for what the angel said to her to become reality. And I consider what I would do were I in her shoes. I consider how at best I grumble and complain to myself if the will of God should upset my life or my plans in any way, whether great or small. 
I consider how I am more likely to rebel against God and His will when it conflicts with my own. I consider how I would rather insist on having my own way. Coming up with any and every rationalization to explain just why my way is better than God's. When my will conflicts with God's, how I wish I could simply and humbly and in a fully committed way, say, Behold your servant, Lord, and trust that God has it handled. But we can. We can do that. Why? Because when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. He's a son, fully human just like you and me. He's a son, the son of God, true God, whose holy, precious blood redeems you and me and all people from sin and death. He is a Savior, our Savior. So in view of that, in view of the fact that God gives His Son, what can I, what can you give to God A servant. Behold your servant, Lord. May God grant that for the sake of his son Jesus. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.